Hello, this is Dennis Favero. In this segment, we will be talking about employment at will and its related exceptions. I presume that all of you have read the introductory employment law course information. If you haven't, please do so. That will give you more background information as we move forward in this course. What's employment at will? It involves an, an ability of the employer or the employee to end their relationship at their discretionary will. Where there is a term agreement or a fixed conclusion for the employment relationship, there will not be employment at will. In other words, if the parties have agreed that the employment relationship will end at a fixed date or upon the conclusion of a particular event, then there is not at will employment in place. Where, for example, there is a union setting involving a collective bargaining agreement, at will employment will not be present. A collective bargaining agreement is a contract that has been negotiated between labor and management uh, and the union that sets forth certain conditions for employment and particularly regarding termination. With at will employment, Either party may end the employment relationship without cause, at any time, for any reason, even without notice. The reason may be a bad one. It doesn't have to be fair. Let's talk of examples regarding cause. Uh, for instance, purposeful violation of an employer's rules or policies would constitute cause. Cause would be a good reason to end the employment relationship by the employer. Continued absenteeism or theft of employer property would be examples of cause violations. Workplace violence would be an example of a cause-based reason to end the employment relationship. Any conduct which is detrimental to the employer's interest can be argued as cause to warrant the ending of an employment relationship. With at-will employment, cause is not required. That's a distinction that we should be well aware of. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that I own a company, and I've owned this company for over 40 years, and during those 40 years, I've employed an individual named Bob. Bob has been an excellent employee. He's always appeared at work on time. He's got a history of outstanding performance reviews, and he's extremely trustworthy. Nothing that he has done would ever warrant cause or reason for me to end his employment relationship with the company. One day, Bob comes to work, and he's wearing a blue sweatshirt. Now, he's worn this blue sweatshirt uh, in the past. But let's say on this given day, I've formed the opinion that I do not like blue sweatshirts, particularly worn by employees. But I've seen that Bob now is wearing this blue sweatshirt. And I approach Bob and I say, Bob, you are fired. Bob says, why? I tell him that he's wearing a blue sweatshirt. Uh, Bob, of course, is upset. He's angry. I tell him that he's an at-will employee. I can fire him at any time, with or without cause. And I don't like wearing, I don't like employees uh, wearing blue sweatshirts. I see no other employee wearing a blue sweatshirt. And I have fired him for that reason. Is that a good reason to fire? All of you will say, of course not. That's a bad reason. However, is that reason that I've conveyed to Bob illegal? Have I violated Bob's rights? Do you recognize any exceptions to the at-will employment rule that you've read and studied so far that could be raised as a potential claim that Bob could pursue for so-called wrongful termination? That's a question. Let's think about that 
that question and the analysis which will go into answering uh, that question. Let's look at the context of the occurrence of my example. Let's assume that the very next day I'm interviewing for Bob's replacement. And I interview and I hire a person who is substantially younger in age. Now, if I've had Bob as an employee for 40 some years, he's probably in his late 50s or 60s, perhaps even older. In this example that I'm conveying for our discussion, I hire a substantially younger employee, probably in his 20s. I don't ask him his age, but he's probably in his 20s. And during the interview, he's wearing a blue sweatshirt. When he comes to work the first day of his employment, he's also wearing a blue sweatshirt. I ignore the fact that he's wearing a blue sweatshirt. Would those circumstances raise any question in your minds? as to the motivation behind my decision to fire Bob. Courts allow for both direct and indirect evidence to be used to show uh, discrimination claims, wrongful violation, wrongful termination claims, and other uh, legal uh, violations to end the employment relationship, which would be at will. Is there anything based on that scenario that I've just described that raises your suspicions that the motivation behind my reason to terminate could be unlawful? We're going to study in this course anti-discrimination laws. One law in particular we'll study is the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. The law will set forth in that act that anyone who is over age 40 falls within the jurisdictional protections of the statute and should not be subject to terms, conditions of employment or be terminated in violation of their age discrimination rights. Now, I didn't say, Bob, you're fired because of your age. If I did, that would be an example of direct evidence. Uh, as earlier noted, the law does not require direct evidence to establish discrimination. Indirect evidence may also be used to establish unlawful terminations and discrimination issues. Another uh, term for indirect evidence is probably one that you've heard or read in your experience, and that would be circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is based on inferences, inferences that can be drawn from the context, from the setting, from comments, remarks, innuendos, the backdrop, the history. Given my example involving the termination of Bob, can you infer that perhaps based on those contextual circumstances, that there could be an illegal age reason that motivated my decision and action in terminating him? Perhaps yes. That would be an example of an exception to the at-will employment rule, which we'll be studying. In fact, throughout this course, all of the statutory and common law examples will be at-will employment exceptions. And we'll talk about that in much more detail throughout this course. Let's look at the three general categories of exceptions. Contract exceptions, express or implied. Statutory anti-discrimination exceptions, which would also include statutory anti-retaliation. And the third category being public policy whistleblower-based discharge. Let's look at the first exception, contract exceptions. Now, in a situation where the parties have agreed to a particular time frame in which their employment is going to be measured, there's not going to exist 
at-will employment. But let me give you an example. Let's say that Ann, who owns ABC Inc., hires Bob and hires Bob to work for one year. His employment would begin January 1. It would end December 31 of that year. Can Ann terminate Bob's employment at her discretionary will? Well, she could, but there would be a contract claim that would be raised, and there would be a breach of a contract. Why? Because there was an agreement that Bob accepted, that she promised employment for a one-year period of time, January 1 through December 31st, so therefore, at-will employment would not exist to allow for the right to terminate at her discretionary will with or without cause. She would need cause to terminate that employment agreement. Otherwise, she could be liable for breach of contract. Let's talk about a case in Illinois that has had major impact throughout the United States regarding uh, this area of law and the exception to the at-will employment rule for express or implied promises of continued employment. And just so we're clear, where there is a contract for a given time frame or the occurrence of an event, there will not be at-will employment. The employment will be based on a contract. And there are going to be contract elements that would need to be required in order for there to be a contract that courts would consider enforceable. Let me give you, by way of background, the five elements that traditionally form an enforceable contract. The first element would be an offer. The employer offers an employee prospective at that point, employment. Second element would be acceptance. The employee accepts that offer of employment. The third element would be consideration. Consideration would be defined as the giving up of something or the incurring of a detriment when that detriment ordinarily would not be incurred. Now, would the employee have to accept employment? No, but if the employee does accept employment, that employee is incurring a detriment, so-called, or the obligation to continue to work under the direction and obligation here of his or her responsibilities to the employer. That undertaking of an obligation, giving up something that that person wouldn't have to give up otherwise, namely the freedom to work elsewhere or the freedom not to work, would underscore the existence of consideration. The fourth element of a contract would be capacity. And that would be where the individuals have the legal capacity to contract. Minors, for instance, may have the right to contract, but the obligations that they have uh, could be uh, not enforceable due to the minority status uh, of, their, of their situation. So an employer that hires a minor would be hiring the minor at its own peril, uh, given the capacity issue. The fifth element the fifth element would be a legal objective. In other words, if the courts or the legislature uh, accepts the uh, nature of that employment as being legal, uh, then it would be enforceable. So you could not contract, for example, for the undertaking of some obligation which the courts or the legislature has deemed as illegal. Uh, then if so, the contract would be unenforceable. Well, let's turn to the case of Dull DeLeo versus St. Mary Nazareth Hospital, a case that was decided by the Illinois Supreme Court in 1987. The facts of the case are as follows. Nora Dell DeLeo 
who had worked for the hospital for 11 years was fired without notice for unsatisfactory performance. Now, would unsatisfactory performance be a good reason to terminate? Of course. The employee's handbook, or I should say the um, hospital's employee handbook, provided that an employee could be terminated for enumerated causes following, and I put this in quotation marks, proper notice and investigation. Now, let's go back for just a moment. The at-will employment rule says that an employee could be fired by an employer for any reason, with notice or without notice, for cause or no cause. In this case, Adola Leo was clearly an at-will employee. There's no argument that she had a contract for a fixed period of time. But she did argue that there was an implied promise of continued employment based on language contained in an employment handbook. Dalda Leo contended before the Supreme Court of Illinois that such a provision within the handbook had a limiting effect on her at-will employment status and created enforceable contract rights that barred the hospital from terminating her without following the safeguards of notice and an investigation. The Supreme Court agreed holding that an employee handbook or other policy statement created enforceable contractual rights if their traditional requirements or contract formation were present. Let's look at this in more detail. The court set forth the following requirements. One, the language must contain a promise clear enough that an employee would reasonably believe that an offer, I think there's a misprint here in your uh, PowerPoint, an offer had been made. Two, the statement must be disseminated to the employee in such a manner that the employee is aware of its contents and reasonably believes it to be an offer. Now, what's the nature of the offer? That would be the handbook and the policies contained within that handbook. What would be the nature of acceptance? Nora Dudaleo's agreement to be bound by the handbook terms. Many employers will require the employee to sign a written acknowledgement of receipt of that handbook. That acknowledgement receipt would constitute acceptance, assuming that the a handbook would be considered as a legal offer conveyed to the employee. Three, the employee must accept the offer by continuing to work after learning of the policy statement. According to the Supreme Court in Dodaleo, the employee's continued work constitutes consideration for the promise. Many of you probably have at your workplaces employment handbooks. What are the values or what would be the benefit value of having an employment handbook? An answer to that question may be, well, the handbook provides information. It contains policies. It provides the opportunity for the employee to understand the employer's expectations. And if those expectations set forth are not met, the policies might provide a basis for termination, suspension, or otherwise. The employee may reasonably rely on those policies as informational conditions for their continued work and the expectations that their employers have regarding their conduct or their performance. Many handbooks contain provisions that involve a sequence of events that must take place before there is any adverse action, such as a suspension or termination. Uh, there might be sequential uh, events that take place, being notice of poor performance, probation, suspension, or anything that might set forth uh, some understanding and events that would occur. Well, in the Del Deleo case, Nora Del Deleo argued that some of those sequential events did not take place. She expected that they would, 
and argued that there was a contract that existed based on her acceptance and her continued work. You can imagine when the Supreme Court of Illinois decided the outcome of that case, there was tremendous upheaval in the uh, employment world, if you will, regarding these handbooks. Could every handbook be considered as a contract? Well, arguably, yes. And if the provisions of that contract weren't met, could there be liability based on breach of contract? Perhaps so. Many employers, as a result of the Del Valeo case, uh, took steps to avoid the interpretation of handbooks as being considered as contracts. Such interpretation would be based on perhaps a disclaimer of sorts. Now, what would be a disclaimer? It would be information set forth within the handbook that disclaims the existence of the formation of a contract based on the handbook. Many of you have handbooks involving your current or your past employers. Take a look at those handbooks uh, and see whether there are disclaimers that are present. What might be language of, of a disclaimer that would negate the existence of a potential contract? Well, let me give you an example. Language might be that the employer reserves the right to terminate the employment relationship at will for any reason or no reason. In other words, that could be a restatement of the at will employment doctrine. And that the policies contained within the handbook are guidelines only. They should not be interpreted as contracts or obligations of the employer. And indeed, there might be some language in a disclaimer that reiterates that the policies contained therein could be changed, altered, or modified at the uh, discretionary will of the employer. So over the years, there has been much litigation involving employee handbooks and whether or not uh, contracts expressed or implied existed to form an exception to the at-will employment rule. In your handout materials, I've included a uh, article, an article that I uh, put together a couple of years ago that I entitled Litigation of Claims Involving Employment Handbooks. You might want to take a look at that article as we go through this uh, discussion in more detail. I want to just note a couple of examples that uh, relate to our discussion. Breach of contract claims could come about by unilateral modification of policies contained in the handbook. And there's a section within uh, that uh, article that uh, gives you more detail about that concept. Let's turn to the section involving equitable estoppel claims. Now that's a legal term, equitable estoppel. We're going to hear lots of terms, and I'll try to define those terms as we go through this course. But equitable estoppel is a doctrine wherein an employee can show that he or she relied on its employer's mistaken statements. Uh, and this doctrine would be available, especially where the employee suffers damages upon their reasonable reliance on statements made by the employer. There was a case that was decided in 2009, uh, several years ago in this jurisdiction, that I want to call to your attention. It's a case entitled Roe versus InfoHealth Management Corporation. In that case, the employee received written and verbal assurances that her maternity leave was approved, consistent with Family and Medical Leave Act uh, requirements. In fact, the employer's handbook specifically referenced the Family and Medical Leave Act. Well, as it turned out, the employer did not employ enough employees to qualify uh, for, for coverage application under the FMLA. Uh, 
We're going to talk about the Family Medical Leave Act in much more detail later in this course. You're going to learn that for that law to be applicable, the employer has to employ a certain number of employees. Well, in this particular case, that employer did not uh, have the requisite number of employees required for there to be so-called coverage or jurisdiction under the act. So the employer fired the employee without complying with its promises, and especially those promises set forth in the handbook that the employee received. When the employee brought a claim for the alleged violation of the Family Medical Leave Act, the employer defended the claim saying that it did not have coverage for family medical leave. The employer further relied on the employee handbook language negating the creation of a contractual relationship and uh, reiterated that its workforce uh, entailed at-will employees. Well, the district court disagreed uh, and applied the doctrine of equitable estoppel and allowed the plaintiff's claims to advance. So what lesson could be learned from this particular case example? Well, the lesson would be that handbooks can form the existence of a contract, and even if a contract is not found, certain representations made within the handbook for which the employee reasonably relied could be the basis of a claim. So this case would be the employer stated that they had certain coverage available through the Family Medical Leave Act, when in fact they did not, but that representation was sufficient found within the handbook to form a basis for potential liability. Now, I've used the term liability a couple of times already, probably. Liability means legal fault or legal responsibility. Courts will determine whether or not actions would be uh, tantamount or equal to liability by both employee and employer groups, depending upon the context. So I wanted to comment on liability to make sure that it's legal responsibility uh, under the law for actions taken and uh, even inactions, which could be negligence that we'll talk about much later in the course as well. With respect to litigation of claims involving employment handbooks, I want to point out another interesting case in our jurisdiction, and that case is the EEOC versus B&J Foods which was a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals decision that uh, was decided in 2007. The court held that V&J Foods, a fast food company that owned and operated a Burger King and hired many teenage employees, was required to formally employ a complaint reporting procedure that could be understood by the average team. Now, within this handbook, there was a policy that described harassment and certain reporting mechanisms to alert the employer that such harassment may have taken place. The district court dismissed the EEOC's claims on behalf of the teenage employee in part because the employee had not followed the company's complaint reporting mechanisms. The Seventh Circuit later reversed on an appeal, noting that the employer's complaint reporting mechanisms, which was contained within the policy found in the employment handbook, was confusing to even adult employees. The court held that because V&J knew it had many teenage employees, it was obligated to tailor its complaint reporting mechanisms so that an average teenager could understand same. Now, what does that suggest with regard to handbooks? If there's going to be language in the handbook, that language should be understood by the intended workforce. Consider, for example, 
and this has been the subject of much litigation, where the workforce speaks a language other than English or reads a language other than English as well. But the handbook is written in English. If it's disseminated to employees who do not speak that language, how effective do you think the disclaimers will be with respect to the handbook provisions uh, regarding the enforcement of a contract expressed or implied? Probably not very uh, effective. So employers should be well aware that if they're going to use handbooks and going to rely on either the existence of policies within handbooks or the existence of a disclaimer involving that handbook, disclaiming that there is a contract uh, implied or express and trying to disclaim the at will nature of the employment environment, those handbook terms should be understood by the average employee and certainly should be understood uh, with respect to language. Uh, and, the, and the case involving EEOC and VJ Foods brings out uh, that, uh, that uh, distinction in, in a little bit more detail. So obsolete or inadequate harassment policies, which uh, are problematic, could certainly invoke some litigation. Let me give you some other examples within the uh, handout that I want you to at least look at and be aware of. A concerted activity, the National Labor Relations Board uh, usually is involved in labor union settings. However, in recent years, the National Labor Relations Board has interpreted the National Labor Relations Act to even apply in some circumstances to the at-will employment environment. And there's information regarding uh, that application to at-will employers and at-will employees' rights uh, that's noted in this handbook, uh, especially regarding restrictive social media policies, at-will disclaimers, courtesy and behavior conduct policies, uh, which are noted in that handout material. Let's talk about contract exceptions with respect to damages. Let's go back to the example where Ann owns ABC Inc. and I, Ann hires Bob as an employee uh, based on the following that I earlier commented on. Uh, January 1 through December 31st, 2017 was the agreed upon term for employment. Would that suggest an at-will employment application here? No. That employment relationship would be subject to contract. Let's say that that uh, 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 employment relationship was, was defined even in more detail. Uh, Bob received a hiring letter from Ann. And not only did Ann um, set forth the term for uh, Bob's contract, but also described in detail the position. Ann set forth in that letter of hire uh, the amount of pay that Bob would receive during that year. Now let's assume, of course, that uh, Bob is a Harper uh, College graduate and that he's making $100,000 a year. Let's assume further that Ann fires Bob on June 30th of 2017. Well, that's six months into this contract term, is it not? Yes. And if he's been paid $50,000 for the first six months, what would Bob be owed for the last six months of that contract term? Well, your answer would be $50,000. Well, that's true. Could Ann fire Bob even though this contract existed? And the answer is yes, she could fire him. 
If she had cause to terminate, she might have a reason or a good faith excuse to raise to eliminate the obligation to pay the balance of the contract if his actions constituted some form of cause that would justify her response to terminate. But let's assume in this example further that Anne tells Bob things just aren't working out. Is that a good reason to terminate? Well, it might be a reason, but would that reason constitute cause? No. Now, in an at-will employment environment, however, absent a term or confinement of the employment relationship, could that reason be sufficient for Anne to terminate? The answer is yes. Would Anne be obligated to pay the remaining $50,000 balance if she terminated using the reason things aren't working out? The answer is no. She may have a subjective reason to terminate Bob's employment, and that subjective reason may be not even a good one. But does she have the right to end the relationship at will? The answer is yes. In the event a contract is found, which in this situation there is, what would be Bob's obligation uh, in order to qualify for damages. And when I say damages under contract, it would be the economic losses associated with the breach of the contract. Can Bob sit back for the next six months and do nothing? Can he just wait until December 31st comes along and then send her a bill for the balance of the $50,000 owed? The answer is no. Common law requires that Bob mitigate his damages. The term mitigation is a legal one. It means to take steps to avoid continual loss, loss resulting from the breach of the contract. If, Joe Bob, if, if Bob did nothing but sat back and waited until the contract term existed, Anne would have a legal claim that he failed to mitigate damages. Now, what does that mean in an employment context? It means that the employee who has been fired, arguably wrongfully, allegedly in violation of some law, statute, common or otherwise, would need to take steps to mitigate damages, mitigate losses by finding alternative employment elsewhere. So let's go back to the example of Bob. If Bob finds alternative work during that six month time frame that pays $25,000, what would be the damages, assuming a breach of contract exists against Anne or ABC Inc. because of and actions on its behalf, what would be the amount of damages that the company would be liable for to Bob? If he's replaced or mitigated his damages to the extent of $25,000, then the answer would be $25,000, therein comprising that $50,000 balance. I hope that makes sense and gives you some further, further information. But again, all this is within the context of the contract exception, express or implied promise of continued employment. Okay, let's talk about statutory anti-discrimination exceptions to the at-will employment doctrine. And for this course, all of the common laws which we're going to be discussing and the statutory laws, which will be covered and discussed, will be exceptions within that context to this at-will employment law doctrine. And some of the federal laws that we will be examining in detail will be Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as amended, the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
Family and Medical Leave Act, and a host of other federal laws. We'll also be focusing on Illinois laws, such as the Illinois Human Rights Act. There are two theories traditionally involving discrimination law, and we'll talk about those theories in much more detail in the weeks to follow, but I wanted to introduce you today or in this segment to these theories, disparate treatment and disparate impact. Disparate treatment means treatment which is based on intentional conduct, treatment that is cause, causing an employee to uh, be in a comparative position where others are treated more favorably by intent. Disparate impact is when there could be a policy that the employer has, which is neutral. Neutral and not intended by any means to treat others differently, but nonetheless creates an impactful event or consequence based on its policy. And that may sound like a lot of legalese, uh, but we'll learn more about these theories in detail in the weeks to come. So I wanted you to have some background um, understanding to those terms when you see it. Let's talk about uh, other exceptions to this at-will employment rule. And again, I'm purposely not going into the detail that the statutory exceptions uh, which will be examined in much, much more extensive uh, discussion and study as we go forth in this course, at least for this introductory uh, segment. 